Hey, we're glad to see you tonight. Glad that you're here. Kind of a nasty weather today, I'm telling you. Glad you're able to make it. I'm a redneck from Georgia. I like to hunt and fish and a few other things here and there. Hey, Stephen, good to see you tonight. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to be in Tennessee. We moved up here because uh, Cheryl's two brothers moved up here a few years back. And so we moved up here to be near them, and I haven't regretted it a bit. And I, I like Tennessee. I still pull for Georgia. Football, Georgia football. But I'm going to have to start pulling for Tennessee, it looks like. Georgia's just let us down here, see. <laughs> uh, I agree with Brother Larry. I can appreciate a pastor that preaches the Word of God because it's not easy. It's not always popular. It's not always the good thing to do if you want to be accepted in the crowd. And my admiration for Randy is growing. I appreciate him being a friend to me. And so tonight, I, I just want to kind of let loose and preach a little bit. I'm a historian now. I, that's my excuse, okay? I'm a historian. I used to teach history. And I, obviously, I teach the Word of God and preach the Word of God. But I'm going to give you a little bit of history tonight uh, also. And so I want you to know that the scripture is the most important, most important material that we need to cover in our lives and continually keep in contact with God. The wondrous cross is that wondrous cross if we understand who God is, if we understand what he did in sending Jesus to the cross. Now, if you will, turn with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, starting with verse 7. This is not an easy subject tonight. It's, in fact, it's one of the hardest things to do in the Christian life. It's one of the hardest things that you can do, loving God and loving everybody else at the same time. It's a hard task to do, and especially in our day, loving people in a compromised world has many, many challenges. And so here tonight, I want to just kind of get us started in thinking about this particular issue, this particular item. Now, first John 4, he's going to mention love in this passage 21 times. Love, the agape love. So look at that passage with me. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world. That we might live through him. This is love. This is love, he says. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. We know that, that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. The second time he's made that comment. God is love. 
Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. Because of this world, in this world, we are like him. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not, is, is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. All the way from Old Testament times, all the way through civilization, all the way through the many centuries uh, of, of so many different Uh, experiences of people through our world, we have to understand that there's always been a drama going on. Love versus hate. Just that simple. You say, "Uh, Brother Ron, you're you're oversimplifying, right? No, no, no. Down through history, the drama has always been. Will humanity begin to love at some point or the other, or will we continue in our way of hatred? You know the story of the Garden of Eden, how all of this started out. Sin came into the garden through the rebellion of the man and the woman. And so ever since then, we've had a dichotomy. We've had a struggle between love and hate. And so you think about this, the source of love, if you think about it, the source of love is coming from God. John 3.16, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The agape, selfless love of God is what he is talking about there in John 3.16, probably one of our favorite verses. But in the first letter of John, he's trying to expand on that idea. He's trying to expand and telling us that God is the one. God is the one that has created all that is here. And he has created for us love as an emotion that we can hold on to. But we cannot experience the fullness of love until we know God. That's what he's saying here. Now, Now, John repeats himself on purpose through this passage. He repeats himself on purpose because this is a hard lesson to grasp. And you say, the source of love comes from God, but where does the source of hate come from? He says there in 1 John, just a few verses before what we just read, we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of of falsehood. Even a little bit earlier in the chapter, John says, you know the Antichrist. You know he is coming one day and he will be so full of lies and and deception and falsehood that you will recognize him because he will be against everything that God loves. He will be against everything that is truthful. He will be against everything that is right and righteous for us. And so Jesus reminds us in John chapter, I believe it was 16, chapter 16, he says, Satan is a liar and he's the father of lies. Our pastor mentioned that this morning with obvious reference to the politics of our day. In the experience of knowing Jesus, We experience the pressure that Satan will put upon our lives to destroy everything good in us. And that's what Jesus had brought brought to us. In the experience of hate and love, we've had so many different battles over the years. Hate, you might say, can be defined. The next one there. Hatred can be defined as an intense hostility and aversion deriving from fear, anger, or a sense of injury. Hate comes in a variety of packages, okay? Hate arrives in so many different colors and so many different shapes. And so we have to understand that that hate is something that is very easy.
easy for us to do. Very easy for us to do. If you think about it, it is much more difficult for us to live a life that cares about other folks and allows love to penetrate all the different persons and institutions of our lives. It's so much easier to hate. It is so much easier. And sometimes, as we see on occasion, you might even get some kind of affirmation because you're hating. That's what it appears like in so many of our anti-Semitic frustrations here in our own society. And so you look at this thing and you say, well, where does hate come from? It comes from the falsehood and deceptions of all kinds of forces of evil, in particular, Satan. Now, let me give you just a little bit of history. I, I promise you, I, I, I'm not going to try to explain the whole thing because I don't, I don't think I can even explain Hegel. A fellow named Hegel was a philosopher, and he is George W.F. Hegel. He lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s. He was a philosopher, and he began to put together a system of thought to try to explain how, how the world works. And he began to explain here in some of his writings that there is a spirit in the world and it continually unfolds itself through history. Okay? Now the way it unfolds itself is through conflict. And he used the word thesis and antithesis, okay? Thesis is obviously just an idea. Anti simply means you're against the other. You're against the thesis. And so Hegel began to think that you have conflict, you have thesis, you have antithesis, and you have a conflict there. And throughout life, we will see conflict after conflict after conflict, and eventually we will work our way into some kind of utopian perfection. The spirit will grow up, in fact, is what he says. The spirit will dominate and finally grow up and become more conscious. History unfolds. The conflict is unfolding. unfolding. And the more conflict we have, the quicker we will get to the utopia. You say, what in the world was he thinking? What was he drinking that day, you know? I don't know. But this is his plan. This is his teaching. Now, John says in in chapter uh, 4, verses 4 and 5, he says, The spirit who, give, who lives in us is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people who belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. In fact, that is exactly what Hegel says. He says, in this world, the spirit is un, un, unfolding himself in history, and it's all going to be a part of the conflicts that we see day by day. Now, there was another fellow that came along a little bit later, and his name was Karl Marx. You know him very, very well, perhaps, if you've read any history. He takes Hegel's idea of the spirit unfolding himself, and he, he puts Hegel on his head, so to speak, and he basically says, economically, History unfolds itself through conflict, and this is the only thing that we can really depend upon. He did not believe in God. He didn't believe in a spirit world, so he put this dialectic, he, he put this thesis, antithesis, and synthesis idea into the economy, and there he expresses himself, and he says, conflict is what we need and what we will get is a capitalism versus the workers' revolution. If you've read the Communist Manifesto or anything like that by Karl Marx, you know that he is big on the workers and how they would conflict with the owners, with the money, people with the money. And through this conflict, eventually, socialism and communism would, would, would basically evolve, you might say, and eventually we've got the socialist utopia. If, if you've been to Venezuela lately, you might could ask them if they're experiencing the utopia yet. I don't think so. 
I think it's a sad, sad thing that they're going through. Karl Marx, from his writings, Socialism and Communism, was part of, his, of our history of the 20th century, and we believe and we have estimated that 100 million people died because of the ideas of Marxism. Marx turns Hegel on his head and says, we should work and we should work to the conflict and in the conflict we will eventually find that the thesis and the antithesis are going to work out and it's all going to work out to the better. The only problem is they didn't understand that God was right in the center. Didn't understand that. And so here, Hatred and deception is part of Marxism. Hatred and deception is part of what they do simply because they desire for conflict to come every possible way that they can think of. Conflict is what will bring the great utopia. Since the 1960s, Marxism has been marching its way through the institutions of the United States. You say, Brother Ron, we don't, we don't believe in booger bears, okay? Don't, don't create this little straw man and then knock him down, okay? No, 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 I'm, I'm, listen to me. Listen to me closely. America has been such a shining light over the years. Yes, we've made plenty of mistakes. But because of our history, because of the principles of the founding fathers in our country, we have had one of the longest one, the longest surviving government that anybody has ever seen in the history of the world. Check your history. We have experienced in this experience of, of our democracy and representative constitutional representatives, we have experienced the greatest freedoms and the greatest system of government that we could ever desire. And so we think about this, this experience that we've had in the United States. You begin to understand, you begin to understand that conflict is the way that the Marxists desire to take our country away from us. Conflict. And as we begin to understand about this conflict, you begin to understand that God has been in the business through Israel and through the church. He has been in the business of ushering forth a time of great love, a time of, of great celebration of who God is. God is love. And so in the experience that we have as Christians... We can see here in John's recipe for real love, you might call it, there are five different principles that I think are so very, very important. John's recipe for real love. Number one, love comes from God. And you look there in verse 7 and 8. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everybody who loves knows God. Everybody who has experienced love and they have been able to themselves share love with people, they are believers in God because love comes from God. Number two here, he says, God's re John's recipe for real love, Jesus is God's greatest expression of love. And with a song tonight, when I survey the wondrous cross, I'm reminded so well, that is at the cross where you and I must find our true self, must find the sin that is deeply hidden in our own mind and in our own hearts and begin to wrestle with God in that experience. It is at the cross that you and I begin to understand who we are and who God is. And it is in the cross as we wonderfully survey that wonderful cross we go there to find out what real love is about. 
Jesus is God's greatest expression of love. He says there that he is our sacrifice. He is our atonement for sin. At the cross, Jesus went in order that he might be able to serve all of mankind. The Father sent him in order that he might teach the right way to live, and then he died the perfect death for each of us, for all of us. His death on the cross brought salvation and forgiveness for you and for me. The hatred and the love that we have seen battling over the years, over the years, that at the cross we see that battle in its most importance, that battle in its most significance, that experience at the cross. We can have the power of God. We can experience the power of God. And John's recipe here for real love, number three, if we belong to him, then his love flows through us. God's spirit comes to live inside of us. If you'll, if you'll look back at Acts chapter 2, the spirit of God came at Pentecost and began to indwell the people of God, began to dwell, indwell the church, and by that power, they began to speak in tongues and many other gifts began to be evident in their lives. The Spirit of God is the key. If we desire to love this generation, the Holy Spirit is the key. God's Spirit delivers this agape love and power to love within us. And that's the only way. That's why I said it in the first of the sermon that this is, the, this is probably the hardest thing you and I have to do is love people that we can't stand. Love people that are standing against Israel in our day right now. To love people that are completely on the wrong track of life and you and I just kind of shake our heads. Number four, John's recipe for real love when we love like Jesus, we become confident in God's eternal love. This is not easy. To love our world around us, to love people all around us, and to love God supremely, it is not easy. It's not an easy task. We cannot do this in our own power, in our own strength. It must be the Holy Spirit through us. And when you see God loving through you, then you will, be, you will be a different person. You will begin to see God working in you and more, you're more and more your confidence in your heavenly home will begin in earnest. So many Christians that are, are babies in Christ, so to speak, they never grow past uh, the, the, the development process they never grow very much, and they forget why they're saved. They forget that they have that love and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of them, and they simply get lost in the shuffle. You and I, as believers, we must be very careful to understand that when we begin to see God working in us, it is what God is desiring to do. But in the process, you must understand also that Satan will do whatever he can to stop you. It's not easy. It's not easy. Satan will do everything in his power to stop the love of God flowing through us. You see, I, I, I admire Tyler. I, I hadn't seen Tyler in a while because he's been back here working with kids. He loves to work with kids. I can tell it. He works with the uh, FCA at the, at the school, at junior high, high school. High school. And that's part of that love that God has given to him. He loves kids. In all of our lives, God has placed people in our lives in order for us as we walk our way through our daily experience 
God wants us to touch those folks, to, to allow his love through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, to touch their lives. In the experience of knowing Jesus, this is one of the main purposes that he has called us to salvation. Number five, John's recipe for real love. God is love. He says it twice. If you remember in John chapter 15, the gospel of John, he says this. John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me or abide in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. In the experience of knowing Christ, he, he uses the word abide in, the, in 1 John 4. He uses the word abide four times. You must abide in me. You must fellowship with me. You must feel my love and experience my love. You need to spend some time with me in order that we might be able to love others around us. That's the only way it's going to happen. That's the only way. God is love, and when he pours that love out into you and me, then we have the power. Now you say, well, Brother Ron, not everybody responds in the same way. I understand that. There are some people, there, I, hmm, I'm a little older than you are, Randy. I've seen kids grow up in churches. I've seen them turn the wrong way. And you know it breaks the heart of God if it breaks my heart. I mean, there were young people. I, I, when I first started out in ministry, I, I, I would work with a lot of different young people. And we would have, we would have uh, on occasion, we've had 100 a, a kids go to retreats and 100, 100 kids going on mission trips and all that kind of And And you see those kids, you watch them grow. And you just hope for the best because once they leave home, oftentimes in college or at work somewhere else, they lose that passion for God. We live in a tough, tough world. We need to pray for our kids much more than we do. We need to pray for our kids. And I know Tyler would, would appreciate love for him, uh, some prayers for him. Curtis Vaughn was my favorite Greek teacher in my seminary days. Years and years ago, he's, he's dead and gone. He said this, though, in relationship to this particular passage. He said, love is such a necessity. It is of God's nature. It is such an a necessity. It is part of God's nature. It is a part of his very essence. He cannot exist without loving. That's God. God is love. Now don't turn that around love is God. That's not true. That is not true. You can't turn that one around that way. But when you say God is love, when we begin to understand that he is the source, he is the experience that we need. We need to understand him so that we understand the spirit's power as he gives it to us. Now God is love. I just, I just thought the, the statement here, there, I believe we got it up, yeah. This was just what dawned on me as I looked at this whole passage. I, I saw those principles there, and it just dawned on me that God's love in us reaches its completion in us as a body. God's love in us reaches its completion in all of us when the hate and bitterness of this world cannot compete with the love God is revealing in us and through us. It would be a miracle of this generation if we are able to turn the thing around. There's a darkness in this town. There's a darkness in this town. You say, well, well we've got plenty of churches, Brother Ron. We've got plenty of churches. There's a darkness. And every town has its own flavor. 
of darkness. Some of you are shaking your head. You know. So I haven't lived here long enough. I haven't talked with enough people outside the church, perhaps, you know. I don't know it well. But I guarantee you there is a darkness. I feel it on occasion. I feel it in people's lives as I see them in places, in public places. There's a darkness here. Changing generations through God's power and spirit, it will take a massive revival. It will take God giving his love and sharing his love with us so that we can share it with others. You say, well, Brother Ron, what in the world do we do? Well, there's some questions. There's some questions that we need to ask ourselves. How do we teach someone to love God? How do we teach someone to love God? First off, are you walking in that love? Are you walking in that love? Every day, every day. Another question. How do we respond to the intense hostility of the world? And we're seeing more and more of it. How do we respond to people who do not know Jesus? They have no idea. How do we speak to folks that basically all they care about is their bank account and their friends and their next little party? How do we deal with the hostility that we face when so many times we try to share our love with them? And then the third question, upon what should we focus and this is just very simple. Uh, this passage is, is such a great passage. Go back and study it this week and just allow God to speak to your heart and allow his love to permeate all that you are, all that you are. Let his love just fill you. But we've got to understand some things. We've got to focus, focusing our hearts and our minds. The next one there, yeah. Focusing our hearts and minds. First of all, you've got to know God. As John was talking about here, when, when his love envelops us, when we accept Jesus as Savior, and we understand his love for us, then he is able to work in our lives. But we must know him. We must know him. We've got to spend some time with him. Uh, you, you know just very, very easily uh, the, the, the illustration I often use. If you've got two young folks that are married, that, that are in love, you know, and they're so infatuated with each other, et cetera, et cetera, they get married and they start living together. If you don't spend some time with that partner, you're not going to get to know them and you will never know them until you spend that time and understand what's going on in their heart. Same thing with God. We need to spend some time with him. Number two, refuse hate. Refuse hate. Listen, I, I watch the news sometimes and I get so mad. But what are, what are we expecting out of lost people? What are we expecting out of lost people? If they don't know Jesus, they don't know about his love. They don't know the, the possibilities of their life, the real possibilities. Know God first. Refuse to hate anybody. Anybody. That is hard. Boy, that's so hard. But I'll guarantee you, you watch this next week or two. Allow God to permeate your heart like I was talking about earlier. And people will come into your experience, your ways that you take every day. People will come into your experience and God will put them in places and they will make you so mad. They will, they will make you so irritable. They will make you so whatever it is. But it's God's pointing out to you that you still got a long way to go. And for me, I've got a long way to go to love those folks that I see that are demonstrating in the streets. 
people that I see lying, lying every chance they get. That we've got to work on it. We've got now understand, refuse the hatred, but number three, discern the evil. We can't just say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll just let them do their thing. No, 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 no. You and I need to object when, I, when we see a lie. We need to object when we see people's lives being destroyed. We need to speak up to the evil, to the darkness that we see in this town. And to be bold enough to say... Kids are, are, are getting destroyed. We need a different approach. We need the love of God. Especially for your children and grandchildren. Know God. Refuse to hate. Do not, do not get suckered into it. God has given us the power to love. And we do not have a right as a believer to hate anybody, no matter how nasty or whatever they are. Know God, refuse hate, discern, because I believe it is one of those forces that is going to destroy many, many more millions of people unless a massive revival takes place. Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24 is a good place to start. It's a good place for me to start. It's a good place for you to start. It's a good place for us to begin to meditate and say, God, permeate my life. Come in in the power of your Holy Spirit. And so many times us Baptists are afraid of the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to come in and you speak to his heart and let him speak to your heart. And just say, I mean, oftentimes in the Psalms, these writers are so close to God. And they just, I mean, they just write some of the most perfect prayers. Look at this one. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. There's a lot to meditate on on that verse right there, those two verses right there, folks. Spend some time with God this week. And I'll guarantee if you begin to say, God, permeate me with your love, permeate me with the, the power of your spirit, I'll guarantee you God will begin to put people in your pathway. People that make you mad, yeah, but also people that need your love and need the love of God in their life. I guarantee you. Let's pray that prayer tonight. Let's just pray it right now. Let's just pray that God this week will just put someone there and you will be the person that God will use in their heart. Let's just pray. God, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you, O oh God, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God, as we pray that prayer tonight, I pray this week, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, and allow your spirit to speak so definitely to us, so particularly to us, oh God. Allow your spirit to speak to us that we might be able to hear your voice. We might be able to see how you're guiding our lives, to see the people that we can touch around us, oh God. And so, God, we, we first of all have got to get in contact with you. And God, help us to never, never succumb to the, 
to the temptation to hate others. I pray, God, that you would help us to discern what is best and what our children and grandchildren need in their lives, oh God. That's, that's the essence of our prayer tonight, oh God. And we just ask that you would do something supernatural. Do something supernatural in our hearts this week and in the hearts of others, oh God. Allow your Holy Spirit to invade our thick heads, our, our hearts, God, that need a softening. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide every step along the way. God, help us to be a church that will reach to others because we know that you have the answers for their lives. And so, God, thank you so much for our opportunity to study your word tonight. And we pray, God, that you would touch our lives this week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to come during invitation time. We're going to sing. Aaron's going to lead us. If you need to just come down and pray, pray about God's Holy Spirit in your life, whatever it might be, that's up to me. Brother Rand, if you'll come. And we'll just have a very short invitation to let God do His work in our lives. You come if you need to. You can do it right where you are, right there, right there in your seat. But if you need to come down and share with Brother Randy whatever you need to do, let's do that tonight. Let's sing.